Last year, George Mitchell achieved a long-held ambition. He returned to Stormont with his son Andrew to observe the proceedings of a working parliament. I've been talking to the former senator and I asked him if the agreement should be seen as a blueprint which shouldn't be altered or a work in progress. Uh, very few human actions or efforts or agreements are permanent uh, and immutable and not subject to change. I think that's generally an unwise uh, course to take because uh, human nature is such and uh, societies are so dynamic that change does occur. Secondly, uh, the agreement was uh, a political compromise, uh, the best that could be done at the time, but which did not, by its own terms, purport to solve for all time all problems. Indeed, as you'll recall, uh, some issues were left over for follow-up commissions to deal with, recognizing that not every issue could be resolved at that time. So I think it's uh, appropriate for people from time to time to review what they're doing, to uh, make certain that uh, necessary changes where appropriate and best for all the people can be made. When you look at recent events in Northern Ireland, um, that there is a latent sectarianism. If you scratch the surface, there are communities which feel disenchanted, disenfranchised, and feel left out of political progress. We've got more peace wars here than we had in 1998. Too many people still live separately. Too many of our children are, are still educated separately. So those are issues which haven't moved on dramatically in the 15 years since the agreement was signed. I don't think you ought to put Northern Ireland up against a standard that's non-existent anywhere else in the world. This is not to deny that there are problems in Northern Ireland and there has to be constant attention paid to them. But uh, d don't suggest some completely unrealistic objective which has never existed anywhere else and is not likely to for a long time as a way of measuring progress in Northern Ireland. The way to measure it is against what was the case before and what is the case now. And I think it's undeniable, indeed indisputable, that significant progress has been made, although not as fast as many would like, not as complete as many would like, myself included, uh, but nonetheless, Northern Ireland is moving forward. Because there are, there are those people who say that this is a, a no-hope, abnormal society where division is institutionalized. You're, you're a lot more optimistic than that. Uh, it has its problems, yeah. but what you're saying is it's not necessarily hugely different from most societies on this planet. I categorically reject the notion that uh, Northern Ireland is uh, a circumstance in which can't be redeemed. I would make the opposite argument. At the time of the Good Friday Agreement, the political leaders of Northern Ireland, ordinary men and women who had been in conflict for a very long time, rose to the occasion and took risks for peace. That's absent in many conflict situations today. So you could make the reverse argument that the history of the past couple of decades is a history of a society which was able to produce leaders capable of reaching compromise. Fallible, flawed human beings as we all are, yet who rose to the occasion at a critical time in the history of their society to end largely, not entirely, but to end largely the violence and uh, gloom that had persisted for a very long time to unleash the talents and energies and opportunities for the people of Northern Ireland. Were you surprised, Senator Mitchell, in the immediate post-agreement period in Northern Ireland to see the collapse of the middle ground? The SDLP and the Ulster Unionists didn't do well at the ballot box. We saw the rise of the two political parties that were the most hard line. They're now in the driving seat. Critics say too many decisions are a trade-off in the current political situation in Northern Ireland between Sinn Féin and the DUP. Does that worry you at all? Well, many have said that life is unfair, uh, but if you go back over history, it's not uncommon that those who are in the forefront of making the difficult decisions that create dramatic change in society are themselves consumed and lose in the process. Uh, so you had great political leaders in Northern Ireland who took great risks for the benefit of their society and who suffered both in terms of their personal lives and their political careers. Uh, uh, John Hume and David Trimble uh, both received uh, Nobel Prizes appropriately for the leadership that they demonstrated in Northern Ireland and yet as you point out uh, their parties haven't done well since then. 
that's a fact of life and a fact of history. Uh, I think that is recognized and will be. Uh, but the most important thing is what's happened to the society. Is Northern Ireland as a whole, for the broad majority of people, better off now than it was before the agreement? It seems to me beyond dispute that the answer to that is yes, it is better off now. Imperfect, sure. A lot of problems continuing, sure. Problems likely to go on in the future, yes, of course. But measured against the prior history, I think it's been remarkably successful. And the men and women who led the way toward that deserve great credit, both from people now living, and I think they will get a lot of credit from the judgment of history. And looking back over a decade and a half now, is there anything, truthfully, you would have done differently with the benefit of hindsight? Uh, yes, but I don't dwell on my mistakes. <laughs> There's, there have, I've made so many mistakes in my life that have been chronicled by the press and others that I try not to focus on them. We did the best job we could under difficult circumstances. Of course we made mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes in virtually every aspect of their lives. Uh, and looking back on it, sure. But I think overall it was a good process, a good result, uh, imperfect as are all human efforts, and it achieved the desired result. Finally, you came back as you promised you would with your young son Andrew a year ago to meet the politicians and to watch proceedings up at Parliament buildings at Stormont. Was that a positive experience? Is that everything that you hoped it might be? Uh, it was very positive. It really was one of the most wonderful weeks of my life. First, I'd spent about five years in and going to and from Northern Ireland, so when I knew we were going to go in March, I told my two children, ages 15 and 12, be sure to bring your raincoats, your umbrellas, your boots, because there's going to be a lot of wind and rain. We got there and we spent a week. There was not a drop of rain. It was generally sunny, quite warm. A couple of days were cool. And I thought that was a sign from the heavens that uh, we were blessed on this visit. And we had a wonderful time. We traveled all over Northern Ireland, visited many families who had children born on the same day as my young son. And we then went to the Northern Ireland Assembly where we saw... Uh, a very peaceful debate, and as I had said in my book many years ago, I hoped that there would be no talk of war because the war would long be over, and I hoped that there would be no talk of peace because peace would be taken for granted. And that's exactly what occurred. In fact, after about 40 minutes, my son turned to me and he said, Dad, this is really boring. Can we go now? And I said, well, yes, it's boring, but that's the point. To me, it's like music in my years. And I later said to him that many years ago when I was the majority leader of the United States Senate, a very difficult and demanding job, I used to be so tired and exhausted and aggravated at night that I'd go home and I'd put on the same piece of music, Rachmaninoff's Second Symphony, and it kind of was soothing to me and I thought it was the nicest piece of music I heard. So I played it night after night. And I said when, to my son when we left, I said Rachmaninoff would turn over in his grave to know that he'd been topped by a minister from Northern Ireland reporting on a meeting that he had in Brussels, but he was.